Good morning. I'm John Bitson, the Menard Family Director of the Sheila and Robert Challey Institute for Global Innovation and Growth. Welcome to the Human Progress and Flourishing Workshop. I'm really excited that today we're joined by Robert Anthony Peters, and he's a creator of the excellent short film Tank Man that raises awareness of the Tiananmen Square massacre in 1989. We had a great screening of the film last night and a great discussion about it, and we're going to hear more from Robert this morning. Robert Anthony Peters is a member of SAG-AFTRA and has been acting, producing, directing, and writing professionally in theater, film, voiceover, and more for over two decades. His most recognizable film acting roles are in The Pursuit of Happiness and Steve Jobs. He writes and lectures internationally on the relationships between art, law, philosophy, and economics. He records audiobooks, is a policy advisor for the Heartland Institute, a fellow with the Archbridge Institute, and is chair of the board of the Fully Informed Jury Association. He also manages his family's retail shipping store in Tucson, Arizona. His film writing, directing, and producing debut, Tank Man, has screened in over 15 countries, 20 states, and 55 cities with over 2.3 million online views and collected over 16 awards, including Best Short, Audience Favorite, and Most Inspirational. Tank Man can be found at tankmanthemovie.com. Robert can be found at robertanthonypeters.com. And again, I'm excited that Robert is here with us today. He's going to share more insights about what happened in 1989 and just uh, his own perspective. So could everyone please welcome Robert Anthony Peters. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, John. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks for those who were here uh, yesterday and for, for those who've come back and, and newly here today. Um, I'm hoping that this can be as much a discussion as possible. So if there's anything you guys have questions about or want to add to the discussion, I welcome that. I've been asked to I'll repeat it for the audience at home. Um, so uh, I, I totally welcome interruptions uh, as much and as often as possible. I want this to be about what you guys are interested in hearing about, not just what I'm interested in telling you. But uh, I'll start off with a little bit of a continuation of, of yesterday's uh, talk. Some of, for those who weren't there, we we're discussing about some of the reach that China has had and, and continues to have, particularly in control of the messaging around Tiananmen. And there's a, a theater in Phoenix, Arizona, the Phoenix Theater, unoriginally named. And I had performed there years ago, and I was really excited to see that they had a show coming up, Tiananmen the Musical. Uh, I didn't know how this would play in, in a musical format. It seemed kind of odd to me, but hey, anything that brings attention to the issue and gets more eyes kind of uh, on the subject matter, to me, is an exciting prospect. So. I've been waiting. I, I got the, the announcement in, I think, March and was excited because it was set to uh, debut at, right at the beginning of October. And then, uh, uh, yeah, I have, I have searches set up for when Tiananmen pops up in the news, I get, you know, Google alerts. And I saw a really interesting headline in a local Phoenix paper that the lead actor for the Tiananmen musical had dropped out. This was days before they were supposed to start rehearsing, August 25th. And this was a guy who was a Broadway actor, um, Chinese American. He was actually the first Asian to be uh, a lead in a Broadway show, I, th I think. Uh, that was my understanding. So uh, a successful guy, success in the US as a performer. And he's on tour in August in China and then there's just this post on Instagram that says, I will not be participating in the Tiananmen musical. It's a typed out message that he signed at the bottom. And there's a picture of that on Instagram. And you can go to his page and look at it and comments are disabled. It's the only one of his photos that you, you can't comment on. But this occurred while he was on a tour in China. And no other reason has been given beyond that. Um, they scrambled and they, they found a, a replacement actor, but they certainly 
dealing with just, you know, Phoenix, Arizona, where you think you'd be immune from this kind of uh, these kind of issues, uh, they 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 were feeling the effects of the the strength of the Chinese government trying to censor the presentation of these ideas, any kind of discussion on it. So, I think that's part of the reason why it's so important that we do discuss it and and seek to learn about it. So, uh, I'm going to try to give you. A brief history, as brief as I can, of, of Tiananmen Square and what kind of directly led up to that incident, the massacre and, uh, and uh, you know, the aftermath of which you, you may have seen in the, uh, the short film, um, uh, the man standing in front of the tank. What are the things that directly led up to that? Uh, as well as, if we get a few moments, I know you've heard uh, about what ha what's been happening in Hong Kong. We'll talk a little bit about that and I'll talk a bit about screening there. And, um, and then hopefully we'll kind of be able to discuss and see where some of the connections between these two events might be and the importance, why learning about this history is important. And of course, why regimes like China seek to uh, prevent that learning from, from happening. So directly related to Tiananmen protests, uh, they, they kicked off with the death of Hu Yaobang in April 15th. Now, Hu Yaobang was a reformer and the students were attracted to him because he seemed to understand the things that they had grievances about. Um, there was a tremendous amount of corruption and some of this was related to the liberalization uh, of the country. So uh, I think you guys might have learned already that during that time, China was opening up markets. They were instituting more property rights. They were engaging in more trade internationally. Um, so they were experiencing some of those economic freedoms. But the way in which they were uh, creating those conditions wasn't necessarily the best. They would say they would um, telegraph in advance what products they were going to remove price supports for. And the people who got that information first, the insiders, usually the politically well-connected, the elites, what they do is they would begin hoarding those kinds of resources. It would drive the prices up. And so the regular population was rather frustrated because they were seeing the effects of, of that. They were seeing higher prices often for basic commodities, food and, and clothing and things like that. So it was creating a real hardship. Um, they were also, the students in particular were frustrated because they felt like they would go to college, but they didn't have the opportunities that they were expecting. Uh, so many of these jobs were going to, again, the politically well co connected, the children of the elite, uh, and, and the college students, much like you guys, you know, would, would feel if you graduate and you go out and say, man, these jobs that I was expecting that I was told were waiting for me afterwards weren't there. Um, an incredibly frustrating condition. Uh, they, they also saw the censorship of the press and the censorship, censorship of speech as being a, as a big problem, right? Because it's hard to even, um, to deal with any of these issues if you can't get coverage. You know, most, pretty much all the, the media in China at that time, and still much today, is controlled by the state. It's, it's issued out through state-run channels. So your ability to, um, uh, to, to have a free exchange of ideas is severely hampered, and you're only getting the government-approved message. So there was this reformer, Hu Yaobang, who really trumpeted a lot of these causes. And when he passed in April 15th, the, uh, the students, many of them from, from the university in Beijing, gathered at Tiananmen Square to show their devotion to the messaging uh, of that leader. Uh, it wasn't uh, any sort of 
official mourning, that would come later. There was a, an official state funeral that was a week later. And 100,000 students came to the square at that point. Uh, in between there, police had dispersed the students that were around. So it was a little bit risky what they had done, but they began to say, we wanted to show our support for this leader and his messaging and the importance of having change in, in China. Um, the leadership was uncomfortable with this. Uh, it, a lot of China's leadership, well, since 1949, the leader for the majority of, of that period was, was Mao Zedong, and he essentially set up a, uh, it was almost kind of a personality cult uh, where, you know, images of him would be displayed publicly, uh, and many people had to have them in their homes. And so you had this strict adherence to not just a system or a set of ideas, but to a specific individual. And many of the subsequent leaders now have also tried to set up something similar. It's something we see echoed today by the, by the current leader, Xi Jinping, as well. So there's a, this danger, right, when the students are attracted to this one leader, but he's not, <laughs> Deng Xiaoping is currently in charge. And so uh, there's a, a lot of jealousy that comes about in these situations when you know, the, the person who is in power isn't the one who has the, the affection of the population. Uh, so the People's Daily, the official newspaper, refers to these, this gathering of these students, uh, these kind of unofficial protests as turmoil. You'll see something similar that happens in Hong Kong, and this sets the population off. This, this specific term, it's a politically loaded term, and it's, it's meant to denigrate what these students are doing, show them as being disloyal, unpatriotic, disruptive, um, uh, almost like hooligans. And this not only angered more of the students who shared in these sentiments, but also the general population who understood and shared the same concerns that the students did and also knew that the students weren't there causing trouble, that they were there merely to air grievances. Um, at that point, in reflection of that, a million people gather on the square to demonstrate. Um, it's, a, it's a tremendous number. I mean, the, the square probably reasonably should hold about 600,000. So you had tons of people jammed in and around that, that area. Uh, they, they gather again on May 4th. Um, for uh, it's, it was National Youth Day. It's, it was in commemoration of an earlier student demonstration that occurred in 1919. Because uh, Tiananmen Square was often used. It's, it, you could think of it like um, the, uh, the Lincoln Memorial, where we've seen a lot of great moments in US history. You had leaders gather there and, and share a message with their audience. Uh, Tiananmen Square is, is similar in that sense that it is historically uh, relevant and the act of gathering there itself has a, a political intonation to it. Um, May 13th, about a week and a half later, the students uh, arrange a hunger strike. Uh, at the same time, you have Western media is descending on China, because there's a historic event that's about to happen. China and the Soviet Union had their own Cold War. I'm sure you're familiar with the US and the Soviet Union Cold War that happened during much of the mid-century of the US, mid to later portion. And China had their own version with the Soviet Union. And Gorbachev was planning a visit, and uh, he was to visit their uh, May, he arrived May 15th, and one of, the, one of the great photo ops they were planning was to have Deng Xiaoping and Gorbachev in Tiananmen Square. But they couldn't do that with the square full of students. They basically ruined this huge international moment that Deng Xiaoping was planning. And not only that, but the intellectual media, the, the, uh, the media was drawn to 
all these bright young faces, you know, all these wonderful, beautiful students are out there. They're enthusiastic. They're passionate. They're singing songs. They're uh, waving banners. They're creating art. And this is what's attracting them. And they're, or some of them are engaging in hunger strikes. And so you had all these Western eyes were on them and their sympathies were with them as well. And it was totally pulling attention away from Gorbachev's visit. This is very distressing to Deng Xiaoping and the, the ruling elite uh, at that time. Gorbachev, they end up having this basically meeting and photo ops on, on the right. <laughs> not quite what he was hoping so they think we've got to end this so but they're hoping to do this through peaceful means so they arrange for a meeting from the premier li pong it's a it's not quite uh the, the level of deng xiaoping but but a very significant leader and he meets with one of the protest leaders uh wu kai shi who was uh, a uyghur student and again, we talked about this a bit yesterday. Uyghurs are the ethnic um, uh, Muslim population in the west or western part of China. And uh, he's participating in the hunger strike, and he is on stage yelling at Li Pong in his uh, hospital kind of garb with an oxygen tank. And this is being televised, and this is not something that's normally done in China. It was, it was very disrespectful, um, and the Li Peng lost face at that point. It was a very uh, kind of distressing thing for the regime to see these students who had all of this public support were not showing a proper respect. Um, a couple days later, Premier Li Peng issues an edict uh, declaring martial law, that they are going to clear the square, that, uh, that they're, um, they're going to send the military in. There is a massive gathering of the external population. So not only did you have students, but you have workers and other residents who are coming out to support those students and their message. And now they're standing in the way, they're blocking the tanks from driving down the road and the troop transports and such to the point where some of these transports were stuck for a few days and they're surrounded by citizens and they're basically lobbying to the soldiers. Why are you coming here? Go back home, go to your, your villages because they're pulling soldiers from the countryside. Many people who had never even been to the city and they were they were confused. They were wondering what was going on. You know, we're soldiers. We're, yeah, our job is to attack, you know, foreign agents, foreign enemies. And why are we being sent here? And then you have people outside the bus who are trying to kill them with kindness, essentially offering them food and calling them brother and sister and, you know, uh, uh, trying to elicit an empathetic response. Why would you come here to harm us? You, you don't want to do that. And so you, you had a situation in which for about a couple of weeks from roughly May 20th to June 2nd, it was difficult for the majority of the military to even reach, um, reach the square. And you had the students continue to, um, again, engage in their activism on the square, share with, um, share messaging with the Western media. They created, this goddess of democracy statue, um, which uh, is fashioned after the Statue of Liberty. It's a, it's a cool image. And uh, you could see the, um, they've, they've made some reproductions of it. Currently there is still a reproduction of it in Hong Kong. It was uh, taken off of, the, um, of one of the university campuses there. And it's currently, it's unclear what the, what the whereabouts of it are at the moment, uh, but this was kind of their, their inspiration, their totem that they had there. And the original, of course, would be destroyed during the, um, during the dispersal of the square, during the massacre. Um, at this point, you know, there is so much worldwide support. So it becomes kind of surprising when at uh, late in the, in the night, June 3rd into June 4th, when the police start actively 
uh, engaging in aggressive behavior to remove people from the square. They begin to fire uh, weapons, uh, fire guns, fire bullets into the, uh, into the crowd and run tanks through and, and kill many people. Um, as we talked about yesterday, the, the numbers of deaths vary depending on who you talk to. Uh, the Chinese government says it's approximately uh, 200 people who died. Um, there was a cable from a British uh, consulate member who said that it was about 10,000. It seems that most of the agreement settled between about 2,000 and 3,000 number of uh, people who were killed during that time. Um, afterwards, they issue a, uh, an edict on, uh, they issue a most wanted list, which uh, there, um, fortunately, a number of people were able to escape uh, and one was, there's a, a project, they called it Operation Yellowbird, based on, uh, on a Chinese story. And um, there was this interesting conjunction of different groups of people, celebrities, triad, essentially gangster members, and people from Hong Kong who set up their own kind of version of an underground railroad to get these protesters, many of them out, and particularly into Hong Kong. Uh, which was still independent at that time. Um, and they, uh, uh, many of them escaped. And, and I've had the pleasure basically through the screenings and, and talks of meeting some of them. In fact, when I was at the uh, world premiere of, of that Tiananmen the musical, one of the people who collaborated in the creation of that was Wu Kaishi, who was uh, number two most wanted on their uh the list from tiananmen square he he was the the gentleman that i mentioned who was insulting to uh premier Li pong um and i was sitting next to the number five most wanted who's a who's become a friend of mine uh, and now runs the june 4th museum in new york which i would highly encourage you to go and and visit the next time you go to to new york primarily because the the one in hong kong has been shut down so um and maybe this, that's a good time to, uh, to pivot over to Hong Kong. Does anybody want to talk or ask any questions about Tiananmen Square right now? Any thoughts or questions or concerns, impressions? Sir Dave? So what was the musical? How was the musical? Well, um, I, I, I thought it worked uh, in the sense that it fit the musical expectations. There was personalized, uh, there was drama, there was romance, um, and uh, there were fun songs. It was definitely written for a modern audience. It's very contemporary. And uh, I, I think uh, it, it kind of gives the, it gives the treatment a lighter hand maybe than I would have liked in the sense that it doesn't necessarily hammer specific messaging home, but you do have the, the sense of, uh, you know, you've got a, a, a lot of people who had grievances that were created by this institution and they were trying to challenge that and they were brutally shut down. So the broader, broader swaths are there and it, and it shouldn't be kind of a, a dark, depressing, detail intensive uh, piece. So I, I think it served it served well at, at what it does. I'll be curious to see what kind of incarnation it gets after that. The, one of the producers was very vocal in saying, you know, we are not gonna let this production get shut down, but I don't know how many other theaters will be willing to, to put it on. So I'll, I'll, I'll be curious to see if it gets legs. Uh, but, and actually the, the lead actor, um, he had been, developing that, the, the one who dropped out, he had been developing that with them since 2015. So it's interesting that that change of heart occurred while he was visiting China. Uh, and so, you know, I don't know what occurred during his time there that led him to make a, a very clear decision on something that apparently he had been working on for seven or eight years, but I'm sure it wasn't arrived at lightly um, and I don't, uh, 
I don't mean to pick on him by saying, you know, by if he was influenced in some way, it's certainly they, there can be influence of such a level that it might make it hard to, to continue with, with that activity. So, yeah. thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Um, so, I hope I'm not treading too much ground that you've already talked about with Hong Kong, but uh, I want to set up some of the relationships and, and hopefully you can go with me and see some of the connections between that and Tiananmen, between what's going on in Hong Kong now and Tiananmen, uh, and, and see kind of maybe why it's important that we do think about these things and talk about these things. Um, so, you know, Hong Kong had been a colony of Britain uh, for, for a while. If, uh, I don't know if they had talked about the Opium Wars at all, but uh, there was um, basically Britain was in, engaging in, uh, they're trying to force China to trade with them. It's not quite how markets are supposed to work. Uh, it's, it's definitely an affront to, to actual free markets. You shouldn't be forcing participants to trade with you, but that's what they were doing. Uh, and there's an interesting parallel, I think, because one of the big reasons was Britain had, was growing opium in India and they wanted China to buy opium. The emperor at the time was like, we don't want, you know, much like the US <laughs> prohibitions on drugs, we don't want this opium is creating a problem for our population. And Britain says, you don't have a choice in this. We are going to make you take our opium. Uh, and they, they fought these wars to largely two wars then, one of which the outcome was they said, you're going to cede to us Hong Kong, and we will uh, run this as, as a free port, a, uh, a trading port, and we will have access into China, particularly to sell the opium. Um, which I think is ironic now that the U.S. is like, stop sending fentanyl over here. I'm like, well, payback's unfortunate, isn't it? I mean, not quite a direct relation, and I'm not trying to justify any of these things, but it's amazing how these things can repeat themselves. Um, uh, so Britain got a 99-year lease on the... Uh, or 100 year lease on the um, on Hong Kong that was set to end in 1997. And so uh, fortunately, Margaret Thatcher was like, well, before the handover happens, I want to negotiate the terms of this. Uh, so she met with Deng Xiaoping, and who again was the leader of, of China, and said, um, you know, let's, let's work out the uh, Let's work out the terms. And so they decided there's going to be a 50 year period uh, of which Hong Kong will maintain its own institutions. China will nominally own Hong Kong, but uh, internally, Hong Kong will continue with particularly one of the beneficial things is its legal practices, its respect for property rights, its rule of law. Uh, so that it was set to, to last until 2047. But what we've seen has been a number of incursions uh, since then, and it continues. We'll get into that. One of the really, even before the handover and since 89, Hong Kong was very good at having these vigils, these memorials of Tiananmen Square, of the events every year. And um, they grew uh, larger and larger. And um, uh, they also had a, a June 4th museum there, which I visited. Uh, and it was uh, really amazing because it's something that you just, you can't fathom as we kind of talked about yesterday that that, that would exist in mainland China. Um, starting in the 2000s, you had some, some interesting things and, and where you had restrictions on efforts to suppress ideas more and more. 
So one of the things, one of the groups of people that they went after was a number of booksellers that mainland China would uh, try to, if they had a bookseller, particularly somebody who's you know, selling controversial texts, uh, who would visit mainland China. This one uh, fellow, he was sequestered for several months. I think it was about a year, a year and a few months. Uh, and he's subsequently, he's now in Taiwan, has gotten, gotten citizenship there because his concerns were too great to continue to live in, in, in Hong Kong even, um, and not just China. Um, another thing that I think, which, which goes to the importance of history, was the school standards and Beijing's effort to bring Chinese Beijing approved history books into Hong Kong, which they had refused uh, in the past because they disagreed with the portrayal of history. And I had mentioned yesterday about going to that uh, 70th anniversary of China exhibit in, um, in Hong Kong that was just astounding in its, in its uh, lack of, I think I would say maybe self-reflection, that there was no criticism of anything that had occurred by the Chinese communist government. It was basically that once the government started, it entered into these conditions of poverty in 1949. And ever since then, it has just been one improvement after another. It was an amazing propaganda piece that uh, was, was, was very disconcerting and, and seemed very unlike something that you would see in Hong Kong. And again, that was in 2019 uh, when, I, when I went. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a timeline in 2019, because I think that is it's such an interesting period. Um, and there had been, again, a number of protests throughout Hong Kong. Uh, the umbrella movement, which was largely about electoral issues that they're still dealing with and things are getting uh, growing even worse. But a big issue was this introduction of an extradition bill in, uh, in April. Taiwan was seeking to extradite somebody. They, there, there was a murder um, that occurred in Taiwan and they wanted, the suspect had fled to Hong Kong and they wanted him back to put him on trial. And so Hong Kong introduces this extradition bill and China wants in on this as well, mainland China. They want to be able to pull suspects from Hong Kong and bring them to China. And that's when the population says, whoa, 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 pump the brakes, because this is not something that we are comfortable with. We are used to the English common law system, you know, basically the similar system to the US where you've got due process, you have uh, kind of these, these expectations that we have, a presumption of, of innocence um, and uh, ability to, to make bail, um, a number of things that we often will take for granted. Uh, and they knew that that wouldn't happen if they were subject to the Chinese system. So protests gather to the point where on June 9th, you have 1 million people protesting. Now, have, how many people here have been to Hong Kong? Anybody? It's a small island, a million people, which I guess is about is a little more than the population of North Dakota. And it's 14% approximately. One in seven people showed up to this protest in, in Hong Kong. So you have about yeah, nearly 14%, approximately 14% of the population show up in the streets in the business district to protest this. Uh, it's amazing. Um, the police sequester a subsequent riot with tear gas and, and rubber bullets, um, and they classify it as a riot. Again, much like the turmoil that, uh, that the government characterized uh, in the Tiananmen Square, this, in this time and place, they characterized as a riot. Well, people were, were upset and they voiced that. And the population was growing more and more. Again, this wasn't, this wasn't just students here either. These are workers, these are lawyers who protested. Um, 
these are all sorts of people from all walks of life. So the chief executive, that's the kind of the prime minister, we'll say, like the presidential position, the head position of uh, in Hong Kong. Her name was Carrie Lam at the time. Um, she was the chief executive. On the 15th of June, she delays this bill indefinitely because she sees this is, this is a problem. There's, this is not popular. And you'd think that would quell it. No, this population was still so angry that the next day there were 2 million people who gathered in the streets. That's approximately 30% of the population of Hong Kong who felt so passionately about this that they took their time to risk life and limb to gather in the streets. Um, an important anniversary was coming up July 1st. It was the anniversary of the handover of Hong Kong to China. And at that point, the protests had gotten, continued to be strong and they actually, uh, they, they entered the Legislative Council building. And it's really fascinating how it happened um, because much as there was some destruction and defacement inside, they were very specific about what they did. They only did that with government symbols. Um, and they had things like, like there were, if there was a historic vase or a piece of art, there'd be little placards that they would place on them. Please leave this alone. Don't damage this. Uh, you know, this is a historic item or this is a, an important cultural artifact. So it was kind of this really great uh, model for you know, people tend to look down on people invading a, a space, uh, defacing pro government property or any kind of property, but they were trying to do it in as a respectful way as they could. And that was one thing that I encountered when I was there, because I arrived like a day after that. Um, and the, uh, and I was able to, to engage with some of the protests and they were incredibly respectful, um, at least from everything I could see. And uh, there were people who were picking up litter afterwards that oftentimes the streets would be cleaner uh, after the protest than before the protest. They were trying to put the best face possible that they could. Um, and it was an extremely encouraging moment and, and time to, to be there and to be involved with it. Um, July 9th, the uh, bill was declared dead. Carrie Lam, the chief executive, said this, this extradition bill is dead. It's not going anywhere. But she did not say it was withdrawn. And so the protests continued. And you saw some counter protests. So one of the things I mentioned uh, briefly was that Operation Yellowbird, where you had the triads, the, the gangsters or mafia there who were involved uh, with shuttling some of these people out. They were, they had smuggler, you know, they, smuggling was one of the operations that they engaged in. So they had boats, they had connections and, and things. They were able to shuttle people to Hong Kong very effectively. Well, the triads in this time, unfortunately, were involved uh, with the, the government seemingly in that there was an incident on July 21st of 2019 where they entered a subway station. The subway is much like New York. The subway is the most popular way of, of traveling around because you just don't have a lot of cars there. There's so many people. And they, uh, they entered this subway that protesters were, were coming out of and they engaged in a tremendous amount of violence. And there happened to be no police in that station. And the local police stations just outside of that subway were shuttered and were closed and you, you could not access them for help. Uh, so it, it seemed a, a strange time. Um, the, uh, by August 3rd, you've got the ninth consecutive weekend of protests. And this is, this is tremendous that these things are still going on to the point where finally mainland China issues a statement in August, uh, August 6th, a few days um, after that, that ninth continue, consecutive weekend where they, they warned people 
not to play with fire, uh, not to uh, underestimate firm, the firm resolve of the central government, and not to mistake restraint for weakness. And you would think at that point, maybe, folks who have a strong understanding of what happened in Tiananmen Square, that maybe they would back down and go home and say, you know what, this is done. Um, but no, what they do is they shut the airport down. Um, they got hundreds of flights to uh, be closed. Um, and they, they, were, they were limiting who were, were able to drive even into the airport. Uh, and people would, were finding ways around it. It was very cool to see what was happening with the technology too, because they were decentralized, decentralizingly uh, organizing transport where you'd have, it was almost like a proto Uber or something where, where they were uh, you know, outside of the app, getting people shuttles and you had all sorts of people piling into minivans for the few people, because a lot of people don't have cars because it's just not advantageous there. So they'd be finding ways to get people out of the airports. Uh, it was just a tremendous show of, um, of solidarity amongst them. Um, uh, finally, September 4th, Carrie Lam withdraws the extradition bill. Uh, this was a major victory. Um, for them. But by this time, you've got a lot of people who are interested in reform, who have seen, you know, who have been shown that when they stick together, they can have a tremendous amount of strength and accomplish a lot to the point where in November, um, they have this huge landslide victory. Uh, and they overwhelmingly, the kind of protester affiliated leaders get involved, uh, are able to enter as, as lawmakers. And that's when things start changing. And I think you guys probably talked more about this, but so much of the, um, the nas national security law uh, and other things that came into effect in 2020 were, were to shut down those voices. And the legislative practices have changed now where at this time, still, you had about 80% of the population, 80% uh, of the lawmakers were chosen by the population at large. And now they've shifted it to it's only about 20%. And China had a, an influence, like you could not get the chief executive had to be somebody that mainland China approved. And now mainland China has to approve basically every candidate who's running for office. So they still have these nominal elections, but who they're allowed to vote for uh, is a very small slate of candidates who have to be members, uh, have to have a certain ideology, have to be willing to swear oaths of allegiance um, to, to China. And it's, it's currently a rather distressing time in, uh, in, in Hong Kong. So um, I, I do have uh, optimism in the long term, but in the short run, I, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure what to think. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, so, I, I, I wish I could could leave this on a more positive note. But but certainly, what we've seen is kind of this ebb and flow in history, where at some point these populations have risen up despite. Uh, categorically uh, terrible odds uh, and, and achieve some real progress. Uh, and, and they may lose ground at other points, uh, but, but I think it's just a function of time before that changes again. So I know I'm following it with a lot of interest, but I think I'm, I'm at the, a good time now where I know some of you have class soon, but I, I would love to answer any questions or, or start a discussion. Yes, sir. Yeah, what has Britain been doing during this time? That's, it is a great question. Um, and I, you know, I don't, I don't think there was anything built in to that agreement that was like, well, if you violate this, this is what happens. Um, because part of the challenge at that time was Britain knew they can, there's a few things at play, right? Britain knew that China could just be like, we're just gonna take the place and just 
you know, send troops over. And currently there are Chinese troops in, in Hong Kong. So it, it is, that would not be an impossible feat to just take over and do what they want by force, either then or now. Uh, but they also know there's a huge capital flight risk. And one of the big values of Hong Kong is what it can do financially. The, uh, the amount of business that occurs and, and is transacted there. So China knows it has to temper that to a certain degree. They can't just do anything they want because you will lose all of that investment and all of that productivity that they benefit from. So, you know, but Britain has been, as a country, it's been silent. There are certainly individuals who are more vocal about it there, who are deeply concerned about it and follow it closely. And one of the things they have done is provide even more and they were doing this in the earlier days uh, before the handover, providing a number of visas for people who wanted to leave. And Hong Kong, uh, since they've lost about a couple percent of the population over the last uh, couple of couple of few years, um, it's, uh, there has been somewhat of a drain, and some of that has gone to UK that's provided a, a safe harbor for them. But as far as kind of pressure on China to respect the rule of law and to respect that difference, so and I forget if I if I use the proper phrase, but it's one country, two systems, where you've got uh, you know domestically different practices in mainland China and Hong Kong, but that you know it would be considered one country. But they are not. Uh, yeah, China is not respecting that distinction as much, and unfortunately, the UK doesn't seem to be as actively trying to hold their feet to the fire there. But we'll see, maybe, maybe that, and that those kinds of things can change depending on the prime minister you have. I mean, if you have a firebrand like Margaret Thatcher, that's, that's, that's one thing, uh, but somebody has to obviously care enough about it to do something about it. Anybody else? Dave. So it's easy for someone to think what happens over there happens over there. Why does it affect us? I'm not one of those people. But what advice would you present to Americans based upon these experiences? Yeah, so Dave is asking a, a great question about, you know, it seems like these things are just stuff that's happened in another country. And essentially, what does that have to do with us? Um, and I think one of the, the really scary messages that come from this is to see just how quickly freedom can be lost. You know, Hong Kong was considered one of the global highlights of liberty. Um, and not just economic freedom, uh, which, which has propelled them to be one of the most successful places, one of the most attractive places for, for people seeking economic enrichment, but also a large amount of personal freedom where you can have, you know, they would have Tiananmen Square protests, even with China right next door or uh, uh, memorials. They could have a June 4th museum. They could criticize their own government. And that's being taken away so rapidly um and not just that but even aspects of the culture so in hong kong they speak cantonese primarily which is uh thought to be an older kind of iteration of uh, of, of chinese and in the mainland they speak mandarin primarily and that's the official language and so china the mainland China is trying to institute a change of language in the educational system in Hong Kong. And many people there feel that this is a part of their culture, a part of their identity, that the mainland is now trying to strip away and homogenize them so that they can just be a good supportive product of the mainland. So they are losing their liberty, they're losing their culture, their identity. So many things potentially will be lost uh, through this change. Uh, and so it's just, uh, I, I think these serve as a reminder of 
as some of the founders might talk about the eternal vigilance that we all must have to our own rights, to our own liberties, and, and seeking to preserve that, as, as well as keeping an eye on history and looking for some of those patterns, looking for some of those uh, things that occurred, some of those warning signs that are out there. Yes, ma'am. Um, could you ask me that once, once more? Just like, do you find it concerning that the people that are in charge of Facebook are like kind of complying with what's being censored there? Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, the, the, the question is, if I'm understanding it correctly, um, thoughts on these te large tech companies, whether it's search engines or social media that work with the Chinese government to censor, uh, what's displayed there. It is, it is really upsetting. I mean, you think about Twitter, right? Or X now, you know, it's supposed to be this, Elon Musk makes a big deal about it being this open forum, this public forum for basically the world to discuss ideas, but they censor things in China as well. What, what they work with the censors there because nobody wants to give up on that market share. You know, it's, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of eyeballs on your product. It's a ton of money. And these companies are not willing to forego that for a principle. And yeah, I think it's, it's very disappointing. Um, it's, it's understandable, of course, right? Billions of dollars at stake. I'd love billions of dollars, but at what price? And I think that's where uh, the ethical component has to come in. And as wonderful as markets are, there's markets in everything, right? There's markets for uh, assassinations. That's maybe not one of the markets that, that are best to foster. So it's important that there be an ethical component with those markets too, that, you know, sure, a company can opt, I guess, to, uh, to work under those conditions, but it does seem to be a betrayal especially of a mission, if your mission is to bring people together in open discussion, well, you're not allowing that to happen if you're working with the Chinese government. So, yes, ma'am. So there's been a lot of talk, I feel like, about TikTok as a national like, security threat. What is your take on TikTok in China and how that is going down? Yeah, so it's a great question um, because like most uh, businesses that, that, are, that come out of China, they are either entirely owned or partially owned by the government and subject to Chinese rules and, uh, and to their legal practices. So, um, and TikTok, it, I think it very clearly is a national security concern. That being said, I think if you all want TikTok, you, you should be able to have it. it would, it's good to know that the Chinese government is probably has access to every single thing you post on there and anything that that app can access in your phone. I do not uh, use TikTok uh, or Weibo for that matter. I remember meeting some Chinese filmmakers who were like, oh, get Weibo, we'll discuss. And I was like, this one time when he's filmmaker was sitting there just shaking his head, look at me, no, don't do it. Uh, since that's their, their internal um, social media program. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I do think the concerns are valid. Uh, I am not in favor of it being banned, um, but, uh, but I know I am not willing to use it. Uh, although sometimes I see the videos when people put them on YouTube and things like that. So I get to enjoy it from another party, but I, I just don't want to give the Chinese government that much access to my information. Dave. Yeah. Uh, similar to that, then, what do you feel about the government, our government's interaction with a group at Stanford to stifle free speech on social media? Um, can you tell me more about that? 
This is a group that various departments in the federal government, our federal government, have created a separate agency to supposedly do research on communications and disinformation and with a group at Stanford. That group itself has actually then gone to the social media and said, these people are spreading disinformation. We uh, need to shut them down. Okay. Although yeah. Although much of the information has been proved to actually be accurate. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Dave asks about, um, about what are about our government, the U.S. government's efforts at uh, curbing what they would consider misinformation. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that it concerns me because I see parallels between that and uh, what the Chinese government practices with their media uh, all the time, every day. Um, you know, I, I I think I mentioned yesterday, probably, that those images, the image of the tank man is something that you cannot see uh, on if you do a search in China. It's not something you can talk about. Um, it's not, yeah, not something that you can share or find. And they have such strict limitations and they decide, you know, what is the valid information? What is the valid uh, interpretation? The event and i think that's a very dangerous precedent it's certainly an incursion on liberty and the fact that um, the u.s government can't understand that or see that is distressing thanks anybody else we got a uh, just very few minutes left hey, just a quick question about how yeah john Yeah. So John was asking about my uh, my experience with screening in Hong Kong. It was really terrific. I mean, the, what what stood out the most to me was just how supportive people were and how grateful that they were. First off, they were shocked that I knew about Tiananmen Square, and then they were shocked that I knew about what they were protesting about. And they were just so thrilled to know that there are people out in the rest of the world that care about them and and what's going on. So, uh, and I, I think that's one of the things, I guess if I would encourage you guys to do anything is, is I, I hope this has sparked some interest and in that you'll look into more of what's going on in Hong Kong and, and maybe share, uh, share it with, with friends or family. Maybe at Thanksgiving, you can talk about, you know, do a little research on this and discuss what's happening and, and maybe what you see as are implications for things here in, in the U.S., things that that distress you. Uh, um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's, they, they were grateful to know that they weren't totally alone out there and that they weren't, uh, that the re that the rest of the world is, is watching. And it, that makes it harder for these regimes to do bad things. Doesn't mean that they won't, but it's much harder to do it with the eyes of the world watching. Um, so yeah, I would encourage you to, Keep your eyes open and, and you know, with, with what's going on in Hong Kong and what's going on with the Uyghur population in the West and that uh, the attempts to exterminate that, uh, that, that group of, of, of folks. I mean, that, that's been kind of a, another fascinating example where they've, they've shifted, um, they basically lumped them in with war, the war on terror. And they knew they could do that because of so much Western hatred of, of Muslim populations around the world. So they knew it was an easy sell. We just say that they're terrorists. And there's very little incidence of what would be considered terrorism um, uh, uh, by that population. But it's been the, the actions that they've taken have been disproportionate to, um, to what, they, what they allege that they, they've got to deal with. So, uh, you know, and, and we talked about Ennis Cantor yesterday and, and him getting in trouble with the NBA for kind of exposing uh, some of that. Yes, ma'am. China and what they've been doing for the 
some population, and my um, thought is like, what do you think of that, and why do you think that is? That's a great question. So, uh, if I if I'm to abridge it, and I, it's this last one where we're basically out. Are we okay if we go a few minutes over? Or? Yeah, okay. Okay. Great. Um, so it's a great question where uh, kind of asking in the current climate, we have people who are uh, complaining about and, and sometimes very validly about Islamophobia, um, especially with what's going on in the Middle East. But why aren't they talking about what's happening in China? Um, I, I, I think some of that is just kind of the natural my idea that we have that we're more interested in maybe things that the US is involved in or related to or has an involvement in or an effect on. Um, and and certainly the, the US has been involved a lot in the Middle East uh, and with Israel. Um, I, I think also is what plays into it too is that there is by some of that population that that talks about that, uh, that there are sympathies with more socialist ideology. And so China, I think, gets a lot, uh, gets a free pass in a lot of ways, because um, they, it still is the Communist Party that, that runs it, although they've, they've got you know, a lot of interesting distortions of it, and they've gone in much in a fascistic way, uh, but they still, there still are a number of socialist attributes to it. And I think um, there's a lot of uh, sentiment by certain populations that that uh, you know, socialism is okay. At least they're not these you know dirty, terrible capitalists. And so um, that that China can be reformed, or that uh, it's got the right idea. And I think when you when you dive into the history, it's there's a, a lot of and we we haven't even talked about the. The mass loss of life, uh, at least not today, we talked a bit about it yesterday during different periods of history in China, and it's not been it's not been a great humanitarian experiment. And uh, yeah, and then it's it's continued to find populations to liquidate when it serves their interest. And now that that region is one of them. So okay. let's all thank Robert again for thank being here and the great work. Thank you.